Hi everybody, this is Donna Knapp. Welcome to ITSM Academy and this month's webinar, Making the Transition. We've got a couple of minutes. We've still got folks coming in, but we've got a good one for today. I'm very excited. I've had two cups of coffee and uh, I'm raring to go. Um, so one of the things we wanna make sure we do today is really um, answer a lot of questions. We got a lot of great questions that were uh, questions that folks asked when they were registering for the webinar. Um, please feel free to add your questions as we go along. I'm going to be monitoring um, as we go along and looking for your questions, and we'll try to incorporate them as we go. So get ready to participate. So in that spirit, why don't you all chat in, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, tell us where you're joining us from. And I am joining you from lovely and beautiful Tampa, Florida. And I've got with me today, and I'm excited about this, Mark Blanke. So, hey, Mark, I'll officially introduce you in a second, but hello. And I would think you're joining us from lovely uh, New Jersey, yes. I'm today? in central New Jersey, yes. Good there morning, go. Donna. I always have to remember you're from New Jersey. I was born in New Jersey, so I am a Jersey girl, although I've lived in Florida way longer at this point than I ever did in New Jersey. All right, so let's go. So uh, officially, welcome to Making the Transition, IDLE V3 to IDLE 4. Um, I'm joined today by Mark Blanke, President and CEO of Alpoint, very much a champion of IT service management best practice. and. Um, one of the few, I think, in the world, um, Axelos uh, consulting partners, and we're going to tap his brain in that respect uh, as we go along today. Also, um, the founder and chairman of the CIO Initiative, which is a research advisory, and he focuses on, you know, working with CIOs and understanding the types of challenges that they're facing. And again, uh, you know, a big part of what I'm gonna ask Mark to do today as we go along is to share those insights, what's going on in the uh, minds of uh, CIOs today. So welcome, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Donna. Pleasure to be thank here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so what we, um, kind of did is we teamed up and we really started to try to look at what are the common questions that we're getting asked about um, Idle 4 and um, what are some of the concerns that organizations have about making that transition from uh, 3 to 4. And I just want to share with you, um, we actually asked you as you were coming in um, kind of where uh, you were in this transition um, from three to four. And Mark, just as an FYI, we had 10% um, of folks who said they were new to Idol altogether, which is awesome. Welcome to you all. Um, we have 20% uh, who are undergoing an Idol 4 transition. So 20% of folks are kind of on the way. 20%, 27% idle three and working on a plan for idle four. And hopefully we're gonna help you out with that plan today. Um, and 25% who are saying idle three and not sure about four. Um, so a little bit all over the board in terms of where folks are and um, that makes sense to me. We had 18% um, who said other. So if you said other, to that question, I'd love to, you know, if you could kind of chat in maybe uh, a little bit more about that, that would be awesome. But here we go. Uh, you know, if you've attended our webinars before, you've probably seen this slide, the real difference between high performing and low performing organizations is the ability to continuously improve. And I included the slide here because I wanted to start out today saying that Mark and I aren't going to use big words like um, transformation, right? Or we're, we're not going to talk about, you know, some type of 
migration plan in, in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, this is continuous improvement. And in Idle version 3, there is a whole entire book that's devoted to continuous improvement. So the idea of continuously improving and, and, and constantly being aware of what's new and what's next shouldn't, shouldn't be foreign uh, to anybody. So one of the questions that we got asked, and we got asked it in a couple of forms, is, you know, what are the key differences between idle version three and idle version four? And what this slide does is kind of sum up for you what's different. And I'm not necessarily going to talk through all of these uh, different points, um, but I do like to point out to some extent what's not there, right? It, it doesn't talk about um, idle 4 being process centric. So a big transition with idle 4 is, you know, a greater focus on principles based ways of working on um, viewing and it's not to say processes aren't important, but viewing processes in the context of value streams. But Mark, I want to I want to engage you right off the get go. Britton asked what I thought was an awesome question. And he asked, what is the biggest change? in terms of Idle 4 that has the biggest value to organizations. So let's start there. How would you answer that question? Yeah, I think just some background too, you know, looking at the transition from three to four, I can tell you even myself, you know, remember in February of 2019, you know, opening up the uh, the book for the first time to see what was different. And the first thing I looked for was the process list, right? And that's just <laughs> me being that old I, I, you know, service management practitioner, just used to everything being so process centric. And so it's like, you know, where are the processes? Not, and as you can see here, they're, they're mentioned one time, right? And uh, um, in, in quadrant four there of the four dimensions. But, you know, it took me a little while to understand exactly what the service value system was and, and how things are organized around there. And, and I have to say, it's actually um, probably the most valuable component of it and the, and the biggest difference from three to four. It, it organizes uh, the best practices very differently. And so uh, I think what happens is we now bring to the forefront some things that are extremely important to the success of implementing any sort of framework, especially the service management framework. And that's things like your guiding principles, the governance, and continual improvement. So that becomes the forefront. That becomes the things that are very important. And then implying those practices against your, your value streams and you know the things that you're doing day to day. So it's a very right. different organization of of uh, you know our, our best practices, but I think the service value system, which is probably still not well understood, really brings to the forefront what's important for the framework. Nice, and we're going we're going to talk about that service value system yeah. um, a little more uh, as well as we go along. So I'm going to weigh in and say that I think that this idea of alignment with adjacent ways of working um, is really one of the biggest changes that you see and that brings the, the, the biggest value. Um, I think it makes Idle 4 very, very relevant to what's going on in organizations today. And we hear this from the learners in our classes, from our trainers, from you know folks who are out there consulting um, in the industry, that they're really grappling with this idea of framework alignment and how they bring all these um, different ways of working together to meet the, the the needs of the greater organization, and and I, and I think Mark, we're going to come back to this when we talk about the service value system. But I think a big point to make here is that um, Idle Four very much sits at that enterprise level and looks at things from the business perspective. In fact, the digital I say this all the time to people that the digital and IT uh, strategy publication and certification course doesn't talk about the IT department at all. It really doesn't. HVIT right. doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the IT department, right? Because it kind of makes the assumption that maybe you've moved to product oriented teams and IT is embedded in the business. So Derek had asked the question like, how do we, how do we address this when idle is being viewed as something that relates only to the IT department? Um, and, um, you know, I think this 
framework alignment is part of that conversation because what it does is take us up, right? And, and makes us sit up on top of the different silos within the organization and um, understand the need for enterprise agility and applying lean thinking across the greater enterprise and thinking about concepts like customer experience and you know value streams and digital transformation from the business perspective. So as we go along, um, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of explore some of these um, concepts in greater detail, but Mark mentioned the service value system and we're not, we've done other webinars where we talk about the service value system. So we're not gonna talk through the components of the value system. You can kind of see the parts and pieces on the slide here. What I really want to ask Mark is, you know, Mark, I know one of the things you do is you do assessments and you go in and you 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 look in organizations and, and, and look for evidence of their service value systems. And what are you seeing? And, 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 and maybe more specifically, what are the pieces that you're not seeing that, that really need to be there? Yeah, it obviously depends on the maturity of the organization. So we, we see quite a, a variety of things that are there or not there. Obviously, for a lot of organizations who have some sort of service management in place, they've been very process focused. So you're, you're typically seeing, you know, a lot of the fundamentals of practices being in place, at, you know, in various levels of maturity. And, you know, obviously across the board, too, of how many of those 34 practices are actually in place. But the thing that I notice consistently that's really lacking is tech is mostly governance, you know, a, a broad governance, not just a, a practice or process specific governance, but an organizational wide or service management wide governance, and also the formality around continual improvement, where continual improvement is, is naturally embedded in the organization versus it being a one time or, you know, or semi annual exercise, again, specifically around particular processes. So I think that's some of the biggest things that we're seeing that's missing is really that, that, that governance piece. And, you know, I've, I've heard from a, a few different, you know, coming in from a, a few different directions lately, governance is back, right? It's, you know, organizations are really kind of recognizing how critical it is um, and, and are kind of, you know, rethinking how they approach governance. Why, why is that? Why do you think there is such an evidence or, or an emphasis on, on, on governance these days? Well, I think governance is always one of those things that's been misunderstood or not understood at all, right? So what is the role of governance? And, and really at that higher level, so if we're looking in an IT organization, we're looking at the higher level um, governance, you know, we're looking at whether or not we're actually providing the right things to, to, our, to the business, to the customers, you know, our end users. We're looking to make sure that our priorities are set correctly, right? And that they're adjusted periodically. And then ultimately, we're trying to ensure that the value is being produced and received. So if you don't kind of have that big picture evaluation of everything and saying, okay, we're on target, we make adjustments. Remember, the organizations that are supported by a service organization is a living, breathing organization itself, mm -hmm. right? So they change. So, the, you know, the service providers, customer is going to have different priorities and priorities are going to get adjusted. So what might be set up as a target at the beginning of the year is not necessarily what might be um, a priority in October. So right. those things need to be adjusted and we need to continuously evaluate ourselves and adjust. And also I think, you know, when you have things roll up into, you know, an overall governance, you can make adjustments to resources better. You know, let's just say, you know, the service desk is overwhelmed with, with incidents and things aren't going well. Um, it's not always about applying a whole bunch of resources to the service desk or to an incident management uh, practice. Um, it may be an appropriate evaluation of where do we stand with our other practices, and maybe there needs to be more resources applied to something like, you know, um, service validation and, and testing. Right. So, you know, those are the things that can be done with governance. And I think, you know, as we look at these different organizations, um, having that kind of central perspective of what where we need to set our priorities is more important. Even further is the fact that we might not have these unified IT organizations, you know, the traditional single group. 
as we talked about more distributed IT organizations, where is the governance that helps coordinate those different groups who are more distributed organizations? So again, you need or you need the governance to kind of coordinate activities across organizations and again make sure as a whole you're achieving your ultimate goals. Right. Yeah, I mean, a strong trend is this idea of moving to more product-oriented teams and having flatter organizations and allowing these teams to be self-directed and to function autonomously. But at the end of the day, somebody still needs to be in charge, right? There still needs to be some overarching right, um, body that's making decisions and um, is ultimately going to hel be held accountable, and, and, and that's governance. Absolutely. And I think one of those things you just mentioned on the fact is when we try to accelerate our organizations, right, we, we apply a lot of these methodologies, whether or not it's agile or you know, CICD pipelines or whatever it might be to try and accelerate our, our um, you know, whatever our services might be. You need those guardrails. So the guardrails keep us in check to make sure that we are still delivering value, that we're still delivering the right stuff. I mean, it doesn't matter if we're going faster and faster if the quality is below what's needed or we're not delivering the right things. Right. Speed is irrelevant at that point if it's not providing the value. So you need to have that governance and that's actually how you can accelerate an organization by having uh, good governance, making sure you do the right things and then resources are applied where they're most needed. And striking that balance between policies and controls, where, you know, in idle direct plan improve, we talk about controls being sufficient but not excessive, right? So we have policies and controls where it's absolutely critical. There is no choice. We need to do this. And because it's law or because we're regulated or, right, it's, it is our company policy. And then using our principles, right, where we don't necessarily want to dictate, right, uh, policy, but we want to shape the way people think and we want to kind of shape the way they work. It's like yeah, a it, kinder, gentler form of, of policies, right? Yeah, but it gives you a little bit more flexibility. And I think that's one of the art pieces of process where, mm -hmm. and this is not an ITIL 4 specific thing, this is, this is generic in, in the history of defining processes, is that there is an art to putting together a simple enough process that we don't overcomplicate it or we don't try and get a process that identifies every single scenario and decision point, that we provide a little bit more of guidance of what the objectives are to the process, what the major activities are, and then we enable the folks and the leaders within those activity areas to make the right decisions. And so that gives a lot more flexibility and also you know, can be used to, to speed things up. But you, then you need to be anchored by good principles and by some very specific, you know, but few policies around that. Right. So before we move off govern governance, one more question. Ruben asked, can you talk about COVID, the relationship between COVID-19, and we had this conversation, right? It was like, I, I, I want to make sure I'm saying COVID, right? Uh, COVID-19 uh, and Idle 4, COVID being the control objectives framework. Yeah, so there's there's a great relationship between the two, and actually I think there's a great trio really of frameworks where COVID uh, can be applied for kind of the overarching governance for um, an organization, so the, being the governance uh, framework. And it provides a lot of the high level objectives that you should be establishing controls against to ensure that you have an effective um, or, you know, organization. ITIL 4, and the 34 practices map very well to the areas that are defined in COVID um, to have your, your um, controls put in place. And the one thing I would say where I think there's a third framework is you know, around security practices. So COVID talks a lot of it, obviously, around uh, the controls around security as well. And ITIL, although it has the information security management uh, practice, it really refers to having some other best practice in place. So you're going to leverage a NIST or a an ISO 27001, 27002 um, framework as a part of that. So it's another framework and they, they integrate well. And I think it's one of the other things too, and you alluded to before, Donna, is that ITIL 4 does a good job of leveraging other best practices and other uh, well-known methods as part of you know, applying against these practices in the service value system. Right. Exactly. It's not trying to be all things to all people or imply that, you know, 
the idle way is the only way. It's, you know, very frequently it says, go here and learn more about, right? Something yeah, I else, think that, which, that was actually one of the things that uh, surprised me the most when I started going through the, some of the training modules and was just, you know, the reference to all these other different practices that have right. been used, whether or not it's stuff from Lean or, or whatever. Um, you know, it was great to just kind of see that, that ITIL itself wasn't trying to be everything and referring to, hey, there's great ways to do this. Here's some other methods that you could refer to to implement right. this practice. And I think that's frustrating for folks who are maybe looking for, you know, the prescriptive guidance and, you know, it's kind of where, um, it's 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 where both idle version three was both a blessing and a curse, right? Because the processes were a little more prescriptive and they gave you a little bit more step-by-step -step guidance, but you know, a lot of kind of bad things tended to flow from that. You know, organizations tended to look a little bit at, you know, idle as, you know, a set of rules cast in concrete, or they, they tended to perceive that there was only one way to do things. And as you said earlier, those processes were very often the most complex form of whatever that process was. And, um, you know, I think one of the beauties of Vital 4 is the idea of minimum viable process has very much come into play. Like, keep it simple, you know, start with what are the minimum critical activities and only add to um, when you need to. So we got a question from Catherine about how do you transition the thinking about processes to thinking about practices. And I want to just first of all acknowledge that um, if you're getting hung up on the word practice, um, trust me, I understand that. Very early in my career, I was given a very specific definition for what was a process and what was a practice. And I carried those definitions with me throughout my career. And, and, the, and then along came Idol 4, which presented a different perspective. And I really had to wrap my head around this because I had this firmly entrenched right, definition in my mind. And here's what I would say to you about that is don't get hung up on the term, right? And this comes from an honest place, right? Because I had to come to that place myself. Think about capabilities. And in Idol 4, a practice is defined as the organizational resources that we need for performing work. But anyone who's coming from Idol version 3, if you recall in 3, we talked about capabilities and resources. And they intentionally left that word capabilities out of Idol 4 only because the word does not translate well in some languages. But it translates just fine here in the US, right? If I say we need to have capability in the area of incident management, or we need the capability to manage changes or to uh, do business analysis, the word makes perfect sense for us. So I think you'll find this concept of practices will resonate much more if you talk about the practices in the context of what are the capabilities and the resources that we need. We need to allocate resources uh, to those areas as well. And then keeping in mind that when we talk about resources in Idle 4, we talk about the four dimensions, which you see here. And we point this out all the time that processes are still here, right? They are, in fact, one of the four dimensions. And um, what's really um, kind of important is that we think about that, right, in, in, in context. So, Mark, does that resonate? And what, what are you hearing about processes? Like, to, are, you, are you seeing organizations struggle with these, these processes or, you know, what kind of myths and misperceptions are you seeing out there uh, about this transition from process to practice? Well, I think, I think the challenge is understanding where that shift is from ITIL 3, right? Because it, it was very clear where all the processes belonged when you looked right. at a very linear you know, cycle of the uh, of the life cycle of an IT service. So you had all those processes laid out and I was like, okay, you've got this list of 34 practices. How do they get applied? You know, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's kind of random. Um, and the reality is, you know, it's both the difficulty of adopting ITIL 4 and also, also I think the benefit of 4 is that the resources can be applied where they need to be. So it's a much more flexible 
um, approach. And but it requires us to understand what is the work that we do. What are those value chains? We need to map out what we do. So a lot of times when we look at the services the service organization has, if you think of a portal or something, uh, you know, and, and a and a user makes a request, you know, we're applying our practices to go achieve that that value. And so we can apply it from whether or not it's a support issue, whether or not it's a delivery issue, um, not even an issue over a piece of work, we can apply it. So I think it's just uh, people struggle to understand how that jump is. And it's a, it seems to be a big leap from this framework, from that very nice, clear, linear mm -hmm. alignment of processes. Right. And it is truly, by the way, I believe it in the capabilities. I call them these capabilities. That's how I reference yeah. the people. So I find it funny that, that you kind of highlight that. Exactly. Item there. Yeah. It, I think that, I think as soon as I throw that word capabilities out there, people go, oh, okay, fine. I get it. Um, so I want to bust a couple myths and just emphasize that, you know, if, if and, and I, I've heard people say this, that processes aren't important um, in Idle 4, and that's not the case. They are very important, right? And they, and they are still very much a part of Idle 4. We just have to understand them, right, in the context of value streams and in the context of our environment. How you handle changes in a, you know, an environment where you're doing traditional waterfall is in fact different than how you manage changes if you're in an agile DevOps environment or how you manage changes if in, you're in a, you know, product oriented team. And, and, and we need the capability to understand that, right? We need to move away from this one size fits all approach and recognize the fact that, um, you know, different circumstances warrant a different approach to a given practice. And the other myth that I hear a lot is that the processes haven't changed. And I, I kind of appeal to everybody to please stop saying that. Um, <laughs> And 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 here's where I'm coming from with that. You know, first of all, the term process hasn't changed. If you look up process in Idle 4, it is still a set of interrelated activities that take inputs and produce outputs. But the thinking around processes has changed significantly. And I'm gonna give you a very specific example, and I'm gonna use incident management to do that. And I've done this same example using change enablement, right? We could talk about any practice and have the same exact conversation. Um, but here's what's different. So first of all, let's understand where practice-related guidance lives. It lives both in the core publications and as Mark mentioned, right, we've moved beyond this idea that a practice is aligned with only one book, right, or one of the core idle publications. You may have practices that are called out in many different core publications. And then you also have detailed guidance in the idle practice guides. And for each of the 34 practices, there is a practice guide. Now, so let's talk about this process thing. So for everybody that says, where are the processes? They are in fact in the practice guides. And if you look at the process flow, and this is what we very often think of when we hear that word process, right? We think about this flow. You'll see that the processes are much simpler, right? Again, very much this minimum viable approach to defining our processes. We focus on um, kind of what are those critical activities but the thinking around the practice has changed significantly. So if we look at incident management as an example, and we look at it in the context of things like create, deliver, and support, which focuses on things like value streams, and if we look at it um, in the context of things like um, high-velocity IT, right, which is in the context of digital transformation, we talk about a lot of concepts like shift left, which we've been talking about for a long time. But we really now in Idle 4 are talking about the disadvantages of this traditional tier one, tier two, tier three approach to life. There are all kinds of pitfalls around that traditional hierarchical approach. So we got to think about breaking that down. Prioritization of work as opposed to just prioritization of incidents. You're taught in Idle version three, you know, impact equal, uh, or priority equals impact, you know, times urgency. And we tended to prioritize incidents only in relation to other incidents. 
when you start thinking about it from the value perspective and what's really important to the business, the, we, we're going to be prioritizing work, right? There are times when the business is going to put the introduction of new features ahead of handling incidents. Conversely, right, if there are times when they're going to give incidents um, a higher priority site reliability engineering brings in the notion of error budgets, right? And understanding when it's time to start prioritizing things like technical debt and incidents over new features. Things like swarming, blameless postmortems, leveraging technology like chat ops in order to capture all of those kind of hallway conversations that go on around incidents, as opposed to thinking that you know, everything about an incident needs to be an incident ticket that lives on some system that, you know, a lot of the developers or the technical professionals don't easily have access to meet people where they are. So that's just one example. But again, we could have the same conversation about many, many different practices. So if you look at it only from the perspective of the process, um, you might look at that process and think, yeah, maybe it hasn't changed a lot. But again, the thinking around incident management as an example has changed significantly. So I'm not going to read all the words on these slides. You have the ability to download this presentation. But every idle practice uh, or practice guide has the same exact format. It starts out providing general information, which is a lot of the same information that you got about the processes in version three. Why do we adopt a framework? We do it so we can have things like a common vocabulary and kind of understand what the scope of these different practices are. I highlighted practice success factor here because you're going to hear about these again coming up in a minute. Um, and uh, and then in each practice guide, it goes through each of the four dimensions, value streams and processes, organizations and people, and so forth, and provides guidance related to that four dimension. So the practice guides live in a subscription service called My Idol, and that was very, very intentional. It allows the details of these practices to be um, updated on a more regular basis. You know, historically, IDLE gets updated about every 10 years. The framework as a whole, our environment is changing, you know, daily these days. So um, I think what you're going to find, and this is going to come out of the community, that as how we think about these different practices changes, um, these practice guides are going to be, uh, be able to evolve, right, much, much more quickly. Um, and attend any of our classes, here's a shameless plug, uh, and you get a free one year subscription to uh, my idol with your uh, idol for cert. So, um, Donna, let me make a comment about the practice yes. guides, though, too. I think, you know, when we talked about myths, and I think one of the reasons why some of these myths around process occurred was just the nature of how Axelos rolled out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ITIL 4, it did come in in pieces, and right. the ITIL 4 practice guides are not one of those books that you just go out and buy. So in a sense, this process, the most process-related piece that we could wrap our arms around, which is really the practices, were delayed in a sense from us and, and uh, segmented off. So people didn't necessarily have access to the processes that they were looking for initially, and they came out over the, you know, a year and a half period uh, where all 34 practice guides were authored. So this may be the source of why some people didn't think processes were so important and not relevant to ITIL 4 or whatever those some of those myths are related to that topic. And that's because of just how this, um, you know, the ITIL 4 practice guides are separate. But it's great because there's some good guidance. It's a great reference model. You don't have to go diving through kind of a generic book that's talking about a lot of different things and look for those process sections. But you do have those dedicated guides that can be updated that do have more detail now around processes and other relevant aspects around a, pra a practice that we probably didn't have before in ITIL 3. Yeah, and that's a fair statement, you know, and I and I think it's interesting. We, so um, the Agile was used, right, to develop <laughs> ITIL 4, right? Um, and, and, and I remember, um, kind of commenting one time, so I'm a, I'm a, a, a member of the Idle 4 exam panel, um, and uh, we actually were seeing like partial publications and, 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 and using those to write our, our uh, exam questions. And I remember saying to somebody sometimes, like, Agile's a little messy, right? And so 
we all have to embrace this idea that in this day and age, you know, we do need to kind of be willing to at times realize that it's not going to be perfect and it's not going to be 100% complete. Um, you know, kind of welcome to Agile, right? <laughs> Yeah, that, it, right. So I think that was maybe some of the issues early, especially early on in ITO4 is that it didn't all come out in, in February of 2019. Really, ITO4 was fully rolled out in what, summer of 2020? Yeah. So uh, That's a fair statement. So all of the practice guides are available now. All of the ITO4 core publications are available now. Everything's out, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no uh, more coming soon. So we did have a question about how do we use the practice guides. Um, and, 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 and again, here's where you see, right, that in the practice guides you will find for each of the four dimensions, there will be guidance, right, about the, you know, in the context of whatever practice you're talking about, right? How do we think about things like roles or how do we think about things like uh, technology and, and so forth? So we already got a question from somebody who said, or a comment from somebody who said, I'm looking forward to hearing about the idle maturity model. So uh, let's, let's kind of move on and, and talk about that. Mark, this is something that is really hot off the press. I know this is something that you've been involved in developing. Um, and so I'm really gonna just turn it over to you to talk about the maturity model. Um, talk about the idle assessments and and as you and as we kind of teased we'll 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 come back to the the um, success factors in this context as well so tell us about the maturity model yeah so for for most of you probably haven't heard but axlos is about to release the new or the updated ITIL maturity model so that's uh, planned to be coming out in late September or early October um, I've been fortunate to be part of the review team and the alpha beta team um, on the new model. Um, and it's different from previous versions where some of you may have seen those self-assessments or the spreadsheet in the sense of uh, you know, the processes and, and so forth that you could rate yourself against. Um, in a similar fashion, there is a maturity model that rates um, certain capabilities of each of the practice areas as well as the maturity of the overall service value system. And uh, that model defines things against, you know, talk about practice success factors is actually how we define, you know, the, the capability levels as it applies to the four dimensions. Um, so the maturity model is the basis of conducting ITIL assessments. So the maturity model itself is just the reference model, right? The assessments are a formal method of assessing that organization, and that needs to be an autonomous organization, some grouping where it has self-control over its, its practices and its implementation of the service value system. And there are, are various versions of it. You can do solely a maturity assessment. I'm looking at the bottom there um, of your list there in the ITIL assessment column. But the maturity assessment just looks at the service value system and up to six distinct practices. Um, a comprehensive assessment is a much larger assessment where it would actually be the service value system plus seven or more of the practices. And then you can do individual capability assessments where you take a group of practices and just assess those without evaluating the maturity of the service value system. There's a couple key notes as well any of these assessments, you must include the continual improvement practice as a part of it. So of those seven or more, when we talk about a comprehensive assessment, one of those seven or more must be a continual improvement. And obviously, one of the fundamental reasons you're doing um, an assessment is to establish yourself of you know, where you are today so that you can improve. And that's, that's a fundamental component of the continual right. improvement practice itself. I love um, that. Another note there, and it's kind of our plug too, is um, you know it, these assessments are only going to be conducted by a formal Axelos consulting partner known as an ACP. Um, and so Outpoint is one of the only, um, it's actually the only U.S.-based ACP at this time. So we will be able to conduct these on behalf of any organization that's looking to do this. This is not something that will be done as a self-assessment at this time. At this time. I actually asked... Um the uh, idle ambassador actually recently is is 
is some form of self-assessment coming in? His answer was not in version one, right? So the answer wasn't no, never, but the answer is, you know, kind of right now, let's get these, you know, it, it is, I, I mean, to your point earlier, Mark, it's like folks have been waiting for this. So um, it's it, it's nice that we've got kind of something coming out and, 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 and we're giving folks tools that they can use. Yes, and, and I will say, you know, Axos has been very kind to allow me to talk um, about this, even though it hasn't been rolled out yet. There are some things that, you know, I may not be allowed to share. I, I do not know what the plans are for uh, longer term from a self-assessment, but I do know that it is not part of the initial rollout. And there's, I think the other part, too, is there's some other added benefits around this maturity model where we'll be able to make sure that assessments are done consistently so that when we're actually looking at you know five or six different organizations and we evaluate the capability of let's say the incident management process we're getting a consistent review of that where a two really means a two you know a three really means a three right. and then we can also get better statistical value across the industry so we can get generic information of different size organizations or different industries and axlos will be able to report on that so it'll give us a great frame of reference that I think so many people ask me for of, hey, how do other organizations you know, rate on, on this practice? And so we'll have formal data for that. I think that was one of the first things I asked you is, can this be used to benchmark your organization? And, right, and, and I get it, it takes time, right, to accumulate the data that allows that to happen, but. Yeah, the reality is, right, we haven't done enough assessments to have good baseline data. So, you know, as this gets rolled out, I would expect that it'd be a year or so before Axlos had that type of data to be able to publicly report to folks. Right. So Mark mentioned that the continual improvement practice is, um, you know, a requirement in those assessments. Um, and, and, and I included the practice success factors here for the continual improvement practice. And I want to mention that for every practice, there are, in fact, practice success factors um, in lieu of critical success factors, right? What are those things that we need to do in order for this practice to be successful? And if you're looking for a way to do a self-assessment today, go to the practice success factors, right? They will provide you kind of what are those key activities that you need to put in place to, uh, to, to be able to um, kind of demonstrate that you have capability in this area. And, 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 and Mark, that, that's kind of how you're using them in the assessments, yes? Absolutely. So the maturity model is fundamentally based on, uh, at least the practice area uh, pieces, is fundamentally based on the practice success factor and then how um, certain capabilities exist against the four dimensions. So we look at things from a from an organizational perspective or we might look at things from a technology perspective to meet that uh, process success factor and then they're rated from uh, really two to five of you to achieve a two you should have these certain capabilities you know um, against that process excuse me practice success factor um, and that is the fundamental of the maturity model nice so we actually got a question mark somebody asked how yeah. do i become an assessor ah so there is a process around being an assessor um so um you have to be associated with an ACP, I believe, and then you, have an individual ITIL four um, consultant, would um, basically have to understand the methodology, an overview, and uh, study up on that, and take a certification uh, test to become an ITIL assessor. Nice. And so there's actually a certification around that. There's a process. Mm -hmm. There's a process. <laughs> Or process, depending where you're coming process, from. Process, yes, whichever. <laughs> so, how do we make the transition? Let's 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 share a couple of thoughts here. You know, if you've seen me do any presentation on this topic, you've heard me say this: honor the past. Understand that if you're doing things that, you know, if you're following practices that you introduced under Idle Three and they're working well for your organization, 
That's awesome. Accept your current reality. Accept that the world has changed, even if we didn't talk about the pandemic, right? Digital transformation is 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 rocking our universes right now. So really look at your organization and try to understand, all right, even if it's working well now, how can we improve what we're doing? And how can we leverage any and all of these different frameworks and methods? If you want to future-proof your career right now, one of the things that I encourage you to very much do is understand Agile and Lean and DevOps and Site Reliability Engineering and understand the relationship between those different ways of working and um, idle. And then treat this as continual improvement. And there's a couple of ways that you can approach this. Number one, you can today at no cost introduce the guiding principles. And we have a great little poster with the guiding principles. Uh, we'll share the link with you. So if you want to um, kind of pass those posters along to your coworkers, a great way is to just start incorporating those guiding principles into your meetings, into your presentations, into your vocabulary on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about this uh, in, in terms of continual improvement. So if you've got an improvement initiative in flight right now and you're working on improving your change management um, process, let's use our idle V3 vocabulary there, get the idle for practice guide, understand what's different about the change management process in idle three and change enablement in idle four and really have some conversations in your organization about how you can begin to starting now leverage the idle four guidance and you know use it as part of your continual improvement journey you can take it up to the value stream level or you can take it up to the customer journey level one of the things that has been um, a challenge for us in idle version 3 is that we've optimized some of our processes to such an extent that it's actually been detrimental to the greater value stream and the easiest example is change management right we made mm -hmm. change management so rigorous and we had this you know bloody change advisory board and so the flow of changes through our organizations was significantly slowed down. We really impacted the throughput of changes and, and, and it didn't necessarily translate into higher quality changes. It just translated in us doing things more slowly. So by doing value stream mapping or by doing customer journey mapping, you really get an understanding of what your constraints are or you get an understanding maybe from a customer experience standpoint of what the pain points are. So then when you do take a, undertake a practice improvement initiative, you focus on the right practices, right? And you improve those practices in a way that really lets you um, solve problems, right? And, and, and figure out what is really kind of important to your organization. And Mark, I wanna to talk to you about this, this idea of practice improvement because I know this is something you do a lot. Um, I love the fact that you talk about the fact that this doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, a months long initiative that improving practices. And we did get a question about, you know, is there a chapter or a section dedicated to migrating idle three processes and realigning them with four? I can't say yes to that. Like, no, there's no one chapter or no one particular section that talks about it. Right. There's, you know continual improvement, right? Gives you all kinds of approaches that you can use to do that. But talk to us about this idea of taking a workshop approach to improving your practices. Yeah, I think I'm gonna make one statement about what, starting where you are and just what you previously said. If you're an existing service organization, and even if you do or do not have ITIL 3 in place, you are still a functioning service organization, which means you have a lot of these capabilities today. They're just, they're just organized in a certain fashion. You're doing fashion. this stuff. Right, so it's not so much that ITIL 4 is so different than ITIL 3. It's a matter that things are organized differently to get more value out of it, right? We can we can align our resources. We can do things slightly differently. Um, we can apply resources maybe in, in different areas more than others to basically get ourselves to be a higher functioning service organization, right? And that's producing that value. So we're not starting from scratch at all. We are leveraging a lot of the existing processes and existing practices. I mean, in most cases, we have practices today. We have processes. We've got tool implementations. We've got people organized in a certain way. 
We're just not thinking of them necessarily in the four dimensions around the specific process to make it a practice. So, you know, one of the things that we can do is absolutely focus on how can we improve one or two of our practices or, or existing processes to bring it in alignment to, to, you know, getting that value out of it and start to move forward with an, an I-204 framework. And so this is a case where we can run these workshops. We can understand exactly where that organization is today understand what the challenges are, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, um, identify what the best practices are today as opposed, you know, with the ITIL 4 guidance and talk about what's in a practice guide specifically. Um, and then also talk about, hey, wh wh how can we now apply what we've just learned on that to yeah. the challenges we've defined and um, start to put together a plan in place to go improve our practice. And it's not something that necessarily takes a long period of time. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I think, you know, the beauty of a workshop approach to, I think, is do you just, there's something to be said for getting people in a room, getting people in a room together, whether it's a physical room or a virtual room, and having them kind of collaborate and kind of establish that shared understanding, right, of, of not only what are the problem areas or pain points that we're experiencing today, because sometimes people just don't necessarily understand what's happening upstream from them or downstream from them, right? And, and so this gives them that bigger picture perspective, but also um, kind of having everybody on the same page in terms of, okay, what is new um, in Idle Forum? What are the things we need to be thinking about and how can we um, apply this to us? And sometimes the answer is we can't now or we can't yet right? Because mm -hmm. of our maturity. For example, maybe there's some um, kind of baby steps we have to take um, in, 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 you know, in order to improve. Um, but you can, you can still lay out, you know, a roadmap, right? And, and create a vision for where you want to be. Yeah. And you pull people together, right? To help everybody to participate in the development of the plan so they feel like they own it. So it's not just something like myself as a consultant coming in and going, here you go, here's your new plan. You know, it's forced upon you by some outside person who you don't even think understands your your culture and your your organization, right? So here you are getting people to to come together. The organization itself can help figure out what's the best way to move forward. I mean, and I, I, I can tell you even from an executive level, I've worked with with you know CIOs and, and some of their counterparts to establishing priorities and figuring out what what to work on. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of getting them in a room with an outside facilitator to talk about what's important who's responsible for what, and uh, putting a plan together. So right. it, it works at all levels. Right. So we got an interesting question. Um, would it not be better to define and use success factors at the level of value streams instead of practices? Practices are just an instrument, not the goal. And, and um, I think that's an interesting perspective, and, mm -hmm. I, and, and I think what I would say is if you think about practices in the context of capabilities that you need to have, um, you can, in fact, describe what those capabilities should look like. You, can, you should be able to demonstrate, right, that you do, in fact, have that capability, and that's what the practice success factors are designed to do with value streams, because value streams you're gonna have a lot of different value streams in your organizations, right? Value stream is really simply a representation of, you know, from the flow of work from demand to value realization in some way, shape or form. And there can be a myriad of different value streams in your organization. So I would say that the success factors for value in the context of value streams are the outcomes, right? What are the outcomes? Yep. What are the value realization outcomes that you're looking to achieve? from the perspective of the customer of that value stream is that i heard you say yes would you answer yeah that I, I think yeah I have, a, I have a few different comments on this one to be honest um, i think first thing you know, we've talked a lot about practices and obviously i think we we do that on purpose to talk about what's different and, and understand this shift from process to practice but i think the other huge change in ITIL 4 is really focusing on those those service value chains and that is ultimately where we provide value. So if you look at the service value system, what you just said, Donna, is exactly that. We're taking those inputs from, from our, our customers 
and we're providing value as an output. And that's our true measurement. And that's where the value system is so important from continual improvement, from, from governance, et cetera, wrapped around that practices play a just a part of it, a very active part, and what we see more on the day to day. Um, but you're right, the ultimate goal of the practices is to ensure the effective delivery of the value chain. And those value chain, if you think about it in different perspectives, it's, it's ultimately what we know even from ITIL 3, it's our IT services or it's our services. I got to get away from the IT part, right? Which service management, not necessarily IT service management. There are services as a service provider. What are we providing to our end customers? And, it's and the how, operating model. And, yeah. you know, we actually, we, we had a conversation with Forrester recently. And one of the things um, the analyst said is that he's hearing from a lot of folks, how do I change my operating model, right? In, in order to be effective in a digital world. And it's the operating model. The value chain is the operating model. So it's, it's, it's critical. Yeah, I mean, it's old school, uh, this business one-on-one of having your, your business processes and your business value train chain documented, but it's usually at a very high level. We probably got to bring it down a little bit to the next level. Of what, are they, what are they each of the services we're de delivering and what are the steps that you take to deliver that? And then you apply the resources and such against that. And those resources are grouped in by these practice capabilities. So when we're transitioning from ITIL 3 to 4 or from any other methodology into 4, there's really two areas that you're focusing on. It's making sure that your practices have the right capabilities and that are organized in those nice, good resource pools that I can apply. And then it's the definition of the service value chain and where you need those resources. And then there's ultimately a mapping. So you have to understand what you're delivering to your customers, how you do it, and then you can organize your work better through the use of the practices. So before I come off this slide, I'm going to ask answer this question just quickly because we got asked it in a lot of different shapes and forms. So the question is, what are the key changes for change enablement? And then I'm going to use the other four uh, term for change enablement that should be adopted. And I would like to say to you, go get your hands on the change enablement practice guide. There is a table in that practice guide that gives you what a change looks like when you do it manually and what a change looks like when you do it in an automated fashion. It shows you that that processed in this case, um, truly side by side. And I would say, you know, embrace that idea, right? Streamline that practice down to minimum critical activities and then automate as much of it as you possibly can. I think another thing that's really emphasized in change enablement is the idea of smaller changes, always pushing the organization to smaller changes. Um, and, um, you know, if you're doing Agile, if you're doing DevOps, you're already moving in that direction, but who cares if you're doing those things, if you're still only doing quarterly releases and you're still only doing, um, or, you know, semi-annual releases. So change enablement today might not actually be your problem. It might be release management that is your issue and you kind of need to take a look at that. And the last thing I would say is one of the things that change enablement does a good job of, and I'm gonna take us over to this, this next slide to talk about this. It does a good job of emphasizing the fact that you've got to balance um, throughput or speed with um, quality and, and, and effectiveness and, um, and, and um, compliance, right? So what you can't sacrifice one for the other, which is what we did for a long time, right? We sacrificed uh, speed for compliance. So the big, a big point I want to make here is if you, as you go through this transition, baseline your performance, make sure that you know what your key metrics are so that as you improve, you can in fact demonstrate that you have improved or quite honestly sometimes if your metrics start going in the wrong direction figure out why right and and you know progress iteratively with feedback use you know the deming cycle plan do and deming focused on study act as opposed to check act really study what happens when you make changes and make sure that you understand right the impact of those changes and if you look at the key metrics and I would say this is what executives are talking about today. They're talking about things like lead time. They're talking about things like the flow of value in the organization. And they're talking about and trying to understand, right, how we balance that 
with things like our ability to recover when things go wrong. Failure is very much becoming accepted as a norm today, but if you're going to be willing to take a little risk in order to move more quickly, you sure as heck be, better be able to recover from that very, very quickly as well. And Mark, you made the point when we were first talking about this slide that this is the things we're talking about at the governance level, right? And mm -hmm. making decisions in terms of how, where we allocate resources. Yeah, so I mean, you talked about a couple of different things. Governance is important because it has those guide rails. It keeps us making sure that we're doing the right things for the right reasons, right? And apply the right resources. Also that we don't outstep something and get ourselves into trouble. So change management is actually an example of of, uh, of some of the governance that we can apply or change enablement. I'd also say something else too, just on your commentary on, on change, is that one of the other things you'll see in the practice guides is the concept of a change model. And I will just stress with people, and I've seen it for so many of our clients, is the fact that there's different change models for different areas, different groups, and different um, goals. Right. So there's some, you know, some software development groups may have a very, you know, very rapid deployment and you'd be using various, you know, DevOps or agile methodology, and you can have a change model that, that meets that. And you may have other areas in infrastructure or some other very, you know, uh, critical application areas where maybe rapid change is not good and requires a lot a lot more scrutiny. So you can have different change models. Right. Um, and also the plan to check act piece and just understanding what changes you make. So from continual improvement perspective, always check yourself to make sure that you're actually making a positive change. So baselines are good, make the change, test it and make sure it's actually better than it was before. Don't just assume okay. because you made a change that things are actually better. Yeah, <laughs> right. You could have made them worse, exactly. So um, we are, and I'm like astounded by this, we are at time, but we are on our last slide. So um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's bring this home by just emphasizing, let's call this what it is, right? Call it continual improvement. If you come away from any Idol 4 presentation, not only understanding the importance from continual improvement, I did not do my job, right? It is a component of the service value system. It is an activity in the service value chain. It is a practice in and of itself. And quite frankly, this is not a new concept to our Idol 3 folks out there. It was a whole entire book in Idol 3. So let's understand. So for the folks that are saying, ah, we're not so sure about Idol 3, let's remember what Idol 3 teaches us, right? It teaches us to focus on um, continual improvement and um, we can, in fact, leverage good practices from Idol 3. Idol 3 is, you know, not going away. Your Idol 3 certifications are still valid. Nothing's expiring. Um, but understand that Idol 4 very much updates these practices, right, to include more modern ways of thinking and working. And so it's really time to uh, move on to Idol 4. The other thing I want to emphasize is that organizational change management is now a practice in Idle 4. Um, you've, I'm sure, heard me say, if you've seen me speak before, make changes with people and for people and not to people, right? So engage people in practice improvement. It's one of the beauties of the workshop approach is that you get the people who are doing the work involved in understanding, you know, what are some new ways that we can approach this and, and, and how, and let them decide, right, how we can embrace this idol for guidance and, and kind of move on to these new ways of working. So I've included some FAQs in the document and I'm not going to talk through them. They're there on the slides for you. Um, I will kind of come to this last slide and just emphasize that V3 Foundation is in fact now retired and the um, Idle V3 intermediates will be discontinued in January of this year, which is like, or of next year, which is like tomorrow, I think almost. Um, and some of you mentioned that you're Idle experts, right? And how do I get my Idle expert up to uh, date? That's what managing a professional transition is all about for those of you that are Idle experts. And it is going to be discontinued just shy of a year from now. Um, so if you're an idle expert, uh, managing professional transition is your bridge, uh, so, so to speak. So thank you, everyone. I think we got to everybody's questions, and uh, I'm going to rifle through them just very, very quickly um, to make sure. 
uh, that there's nothing we missed and uh, anybody that wants to hang around to see if there are any last little questions, uh, I can go ahead and, and, and Mark and I can go ahead and answer those uh, questions for you. Okay. Um, while we still have some folks, I want to, if, if you'll indulge me, I want to just run a very quick little poll. I've launched it. We are um, finding, and we've had some people chat in while they were registering that, you know, I don't know, folks in my organization are resisting. So can you help us understand why? If people are resisting, can you help us understand why? Um, and so we can, we can hopefully try to uh, address that a little bit. So thank you, I'm seeing responses coming in. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, I hope you will join us for next month's webinar. Next month's webinar is Blaine Bryant from BNC, and he's actually gonna talk about how his organization has leveraged uh, ITIL for um, as they navigated their way through their digital transformation. I actually had Blaine in a couple of classes recently, and I reached out to him after class and made an appeal to him. I was like, you need to come do a webinar um, because they're really doing some, some great and some very uh, interesting things in their organizations. So I see, um, I see lots of uh, great responses. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll share the poll results for those of you who might be curious what everybody else is saying. So uh, too busy and I totally get that. For the 13% of you who say we don't need it, we're doing some other framework. Um, we have a presentation called More About Four and in it I talk about framework alignment and um, I kind of directly address this idea of you know either one framework or another framework and why all of the frameworks uh, today very much need to work together. So um, we'll kind of pass that link on to everybody as part of our, our, um, our, our post webinar mail out. V3 is working fine and I hope I, I, I encourage some of you to go at least take a peek at idle four in the spirit of continual improvement and see if you can make those V3 processes better. We don't understand what it is, 35%. So um, that's very interesting and I would, encourage anybody who answered that, if you can kind of reach out to me directly, um, I would love, uh, my information is kind of on the front of this webinar, I would love to, to, to talk to you about that and I would love to figure out how to uh, address that. Right. Um, so thank you all for coming, we're, we're over. So thank you, Mark, I appreciate it. I, quite honestly, Mark and I thought we had four hours worth of material. So the fact that we ran over six minutes, I guess we need to, <laughs> Count as an accomplishment? Is that can we can we can we take it that way? <laughs> Absolutely, it's always fun talking to each other. So, <laughs> yeah. so thank you all. Please, uh, you know, again, reach out, and uh, we'd love to hear from you all about your journeys. And uh, thanks so much for joining us this week.